Three, you two, huh? one, go. Hi, folks. Welcome to our last of the year, our Christmas version of our uh, Saturday Night Live. This is where we stand here and answer your questions in exchange for your generosity and helping us run our Purple Heart Project. Always have to introduce it real quick. Six times a year, we bring seven combat wounded vets in from all over the world, and we fly them in. We put them up right here now. We feed them here. We train them for six days on how to build a piece of furniture, or the techniques on how to build a piece of furniture like it was 200 years ago. So you'll, behind me, you'll see some incredible examples of dovetails done by, and these are all first-time ones too. Actually, except for, except for Justin. I think he may have done a few before. Anyway, he was here in our last class. Um, tonight's topic is Ask Me Anything. Do we have any questions? Uh, yeah, I'll take a couple. Okay, hold on just one second. So anyway, this is going to be our Christmas night. So Santa Claus, who we always tip our hat to, uh, emailed me yesterday and said, Rob, I'm going to send you $2,000 to give away some stuff. So we added to it. So tonight we're going to give away. How many people we get on? Should I be introducing this now? Uh, we have 230 right now. Okay. So we're going to give away a bunch of stuff. I'll introduce it a little bit later. And we're going to kind of stop. Are we going to kind of stop every once in a while and give something away? Uh, yeah. Yeah, we will. So. I'll post the draw link. So it's uh, yeah. advantageous to enter your name into the draw earlier. That way you're considered for more prizes. Please only enter once, though. You'll still be considered for all the other draws throughout the night. Okay. Give away our three dead cats tonight. We're going to give away five Purple Heart t-shirts that are all done up by Angie and Lynn. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick who gets those based on how good the questions are. Throw a fire one at me, Frick, so get me warmed up. All right, this one's from Ajit in Port, from Portland, Oregon. Ajit, how are you? He says, Merry in your Christmas. box build video, you say that you never finish the insides. Could you talk about why? Uh, I just don't want the smell of a finish. Uh, hopefully, you can smell the wood. And sometimes I do leather on the bottom, so I like to smell the leather as opposed to finish. And it complicates things. If you're trying to finish the inside of a box, which, oh, I have one right here. Trying to finish the inside of a box, you're reaching into inside corners, it's really awkward. Now, normally you think, well, how do you stabilize that piece of wood so it doesn't warp? Well, in this case, you've got the joint holding it, so that's not going to change that. I do finish the inside of the lid because that is exposed, so you want that to breathe uniformly, both sides and on the ends. But the inside part, I don't, a little box like that, you're probably not going to have your nose in it, but I prefer not to finish the inside, leave it natural wood. The one thing I do that I think dresses them up, I'll often glue leather on the, uh, on the bottom so that when you open it, you've got nice leather in there, and if you put some, drop things in, it doesn't clang, it's just nice, just a nice way to dress it up a little bit. Next, Frick. Uh, next one is uh, John in, from Cleveland, Ohio. Hi, John. He says, why do you prefer your round mallet over a traditional joiner's mallet? Ah, well, here's two. So he's talking about one like this, which my friend Ahmed makes, and these ones, which we make. So what my claim is, one, is, one requires directional hit, and the other one doesn't. So I'm not looking at the back of the mallet, so I'm hitting like that. And I find like this, it's so much more intuitive than hitting like this, which you have a tendency to strike off one side or the other. Maybe that's in my imagination. But I prefer the round, often referred to as a carver's mallet, as opposed to the hammer-type mallet. Besides, that's too nice, too nice of a mallet to hit anyway. That, by the way, was made for me by Ahmed. That's tulip wood on the handle and ver wood on the head. I should mention, so if you're a combat wounded vet that has been one of our scholarship uh, scholarships, and we go back all the way to 2016, we've had 26 classes, there's 175 of you out there, please speak up. Now, when, in the chat, you need to put at Ken, and then your name, and if you can remember which class, and then uh, I'll, every once in a while, I'll stop and ask Ken, and, and we'll give you a shout out. Love reconnecting with you. Always puts a smile on my face when I... When I uh, hear a name, I remember. And Frick's not here tonight. Irvin is taking Jake's place. Jake is in Utah. How do Jake? I hope he's watching. He and Megan and Bruce are out there with Megan's family for the Christmas season. 
So Urban, who is Frick's friend from childhood, is here, and he's going to be the camera. We got Ken here. Uh, we've got another friend of hey, mine, Shane, here, who's a uh, uh, Canadian Air Force vet, and uh, he's having dinner with us tonight, he and his daughter. And I assume Luther's on? Not yet. He's running late. He was at a family thing. Oh, Luther's in San Diego for the next couple of three or four weeks. Okay, next, Frick. Uh, Bill, Bill Baffa from Florida. Hi, Bill. Says, what design of yours brings you the most pride? What design? Yeah. Is he talking tool or, or furniture? Why don't you go with both? Okay, I'll give you one of each. I, I um, Probably the adjuster. You know, I'd like to say the dovetail saw, but really the adjuster. Because this solved the most problems. I still get emails from older guys who have not been able to use their plane in 20 years because of arthritis or just the aging process and what it does to your hands. And when we came up with this idea, I say we, Jake and I worked on it, it made it so that you could easily make that adjustment without even thinking about it. So probably has the single most impact of anything that we've designed in terms of uh, what it was to what it now can be. So that would be my... That would be my number one on the tool side, and it's only small. I love it when people say, why didn't somebody come up with that idea before? Uh, as far as a piece of furniture, I really like the bloke box. I still have it here, so I'll, uh, I'll get uh, somebody to go get it and show it to you. That's probably... Or the standing desk. Uh, yeah, I'd have to stop and think about that. That takes me back over... I've been building furniture since my teenage years, and that was in the uh, mid '70s. So it's been a while. Of of late, it would probably be the standing desk. That's the one that's made out of cherry and and uh, holly. Really pretty. Next, Frick. Uh, so this kind of goes with the last question. This one's from Chris Raduner in Hi, Chris. Bretchen, Ontario. Canadian. Uh, he says, Rob, what is your most challenging piece of furniture and why? Probably the Maloof rocker. So back in uh, 1986, I was, uh, I was the teaching assistant at BYU Brigham Young University. And the, instru the professor was uh, Ed, uh, oh, wow. I can't remember, forget his name. Ed Hinckley. And he decided to take us all down and spend a, take us to Colorado and spend a weekend with Sam Maloof. And if you don't know who Sam Maloof is, he's probably the most prominent um, furniture designer craftsman in the United States, in the history of the United States, actually. And all of his furniture is sculpted, which isn't my, which is not my forte. But his rock, he's famous for his rocking chair, and it's it's a beautiful piece of furniture. But when you look at it and you think, holy smokes, how could you do that? Because everything, every piece blends into the next. And uh, thanks again. It was, um, it was extremely daunting. But like anything else, if it's made up of 80 pieces of wood and you take one piece at a time and look at that one piece and say, could I make this? Well, yeah, I could make that. And then if you can make that one, you can make this one. And then you learn to blend them together. So... It was, a, it was a real challenge. I built most of it between 4 in the morning and 8 in the morning before school would start. Made out of Paduke, which is an orange wood, so there was orange dust everywhere. So I could never sneak in, work in the shop, and then leave because I would leave orange dust everywhere. So that was probably, well, actually, again, now I'm saying that. And then that kitchen that I did for Steve Corscadden, which was uh, um, a shaker kitchen, that was challenging too. I um, I don't think I can pick one out, but I'll go with that one. Next, Frick. Oh, here, by the way, this is, so this is the bloke box. Now I got to move some of this stuff off to the side. So we were, this was in the online workshop. So if you're interested in it, the whole build is on there. And uh, don't even know how the idea came up. But I wanted to, I didn't want to call it a men's jewelry box. So it may have been Tony Martin that named it, but... Some Aussie that I know came up with the name Bloke Box. So it's made out of a piece of black walnut. It was, it was a really highly figured piece of wood. 
And then I used, Dale Nish gave me a whole bunch of really incredible Clara walnut veneer. And in case you don't know what veneer is, if you take a piece of wood and slice it very thin, that's veneer. So the advantage of slicing is you don't have a saw curve. So if I take a one inch piece of wood, I can get maybe 40 slices. And because there is no curve, because it's cut, it's split with a knife as opposed to being sawn, then each piece is, looks identical to the next piece. So you can build something and you can actually watch the grain flow. So anyway, that's called a flitch when you keep it all in order. So I made the drawers out of, I used sycamore on the sides and black walnut on the front. And then I veneered this Claro veneer on the front and on the top. So if you were to look real close, can you? Can you look real close? Yeah, it's pretty close. If you follow the grain, it comes up and then it goes over. And then the same thing happens on this one. And then the same, one, same thing happens back here. And uh, inside, little tiny dovetails, by the way, are so much harder than regular size. Anyway, so I really enjoyed this build. It was fun. A lot of fun. Any vets yet, Ken? Oh, all right. Next question. Uh, yep, yeah, this one's coming from John Young in the chat. He says, I sharp... Hi, John. I, I sharpened my five and a half to 16,000. Why am I getting sawdust in the plane? You sharpened your five and a half to 16,000. Why am I getting sawdust in the plane? Sawdust in the plane. Well, there's a couple. It's so I hate to tell it to you, but it's a sharpening issue. So the first thing you're going to do, we're going to do a little checklist. We're going to do two things. You need a combination square or something that has a 45 degree angle on it. And you're going to take a blade. I didn't want to catch that with my foot. Take a plane, take your plane blade and get some magnifiers. And if you look really close, you should see a dull surface which runs from there to there. That's your primary bevel. Then you should see a little shinier surface that should run from the edge of the primary bevel to almost to the edge, the cutting edge. And the last thing you should be should be a surface that almost looks black. It's super shiny. If, however, you have dull, black, dull, What's happened is when you went to, do, went to do your tertiary, your third bevel, on your 16,000, you didn't come up high enough. So you ended up polishing back from the edge. So you're actually cutting with 1,000 grit as opposed to 16,000. So that'll do it. And that's very frequent. That happens frequently. Next thing you're going to check is you want to check and make sure that you did not exceed 25 degrees, or 45 degrees, sorry, on your tertiary bevel. So if you put your plane blade on uh, a piece of wood, I don't want to use my bench because I don't want to dig into it. I'm in a shop. I should be able to find a piece of wood, right? Take a piece of wood. This represents your frog. The frog in your plane holds the blade at 45 degrees. So put it down there like that and then move it. And if it doesn't bite, if it skips over, then what's happened is you have at some point have exceeded 45 degrees and some part below the cutting edge, meaning the heel, is touching instead of the toe. Now, what will happen is you don't recognize that. You advance the blade a little bit more. You get the blade so that it's actually sitting low enough that when it initially hits the wood, it'll dig in, but then it'll quickly ride up to the top because of the shape of the cutting edge. Now, that may or may not produce dust, but it certainly produced frustration. I would suggest that what you most likely had is the first problem where you did not sharpen the actual cutting edge with 16,000. You're back from that edge, and it'll, it'll, you may need magnifiers to see it. But the last thing you should see if it's done right 
is a dark or a very highly shiny spot right at the very cutting edge. It's not a great example, but check that and get back to me. Next, Frick. Uh, another one from the chat comes from Diego. From who? Sense. Next one from the chat comes from uh, Diego Ortiz. Diego. What is the best first panel saw to get to split three quarter inch panels for small boxes? Well, if you're going to uh, hand saw, um, if you're going to hand saw your lumber, then the only panel saw to get is it's got to be a rip. You don't want to try to do that with a cross cut saw because it cuts way too slow. You want to rip, and it's a big job, but doable. So, if you're looking for my recommendation. And grab, that's a cross cut. This should be a rip. There. And it's a seven point rip, so it's relatively coarse, and that'll, that should do a good job. Let's try it. Where am I going to put this, Ken? I've managed to protect it all these years. I'll see what it's like to try to go in and rip a piece this big. Now, I've got a great big knot in there, but I'll try to take a quarter of an inch off of here. So I'm going to get the cut made along the top first. I can't believe I chose to do this. Use all of the blade, slow, steady stroke so that you'll survive. You'll find an angle that'll cut better, meaning as opposed to cutting up like that, you actually, if you come down on a bit of an angle, you'll find that it's easier to cut. And the fact that the saw only has three thousandths of an inch set per side means it's going to track very well. And that means that instead of wandering in the kerf, it'll stay true. Use your imagination on the rest. Next question, Frick. Next one comes from uh, Mark Rains in the chat as well. Hi, Mark. He says, if money is not an object, do you prefer the tape wall method or skew block plane on the tailboard? Well, we didn't, we, we actually started using the tape. Now, what he's talking about, I always, I always uh, realize I need to explain this. I, and actually, I was just showing somebody in the shop the other day. Al Clark, a friend of mine was here. So, after you've cut your tails... You need to lay that on top of the other piece to mark your pins. And what you want is you want them to line up. So it, it, you can do it by feel, meaning you sit here like this with your thumbs and try to get it in position. Problem is that that's subject to moving on you. So we used to take what was called a skew block plane. So this plane, the blade is held at an angle. The side plate removes, and you have the blade exposed right here. That allows you to go in, and you can literally cut a little rabbit or a rebate, depending on what country you're in. And that little rebate, actually, let me, let me do it so that uh, you're not having to use your imagination. So I'm going to set this for, I would set this for the thickness of this piece. So I'm going to go ahead and make a mark right here. And I would put this in the vise. Like so. And set up my plane. So I, in and, and setting up my plane, I have to have the blade sticking out beyond the edge. Have it parallel to the sole so it's projecting evenly. Then I would come in here and I would adjust the fence so that the point of the blade was cutting right on that line 
and then I would lock the fence. Now, you've got to control tilt this way, and you don't have a whole lot of reference surface. So I'm doing this with my hand to counteract gravity. And this hand is just pushing forward. Don't let it push down sideways or up. And you pick up a shaving. You know you're, you know you're lined up properly if, while maintaining contact, and the bottom of the plane is parallel to the board, if the blade picks up a shaving right there, then you're doing it right. It should be a full width shaving, so I should be able to look at that and see full width. Oh, get to the end, and I will do that. Maybe three times. I'll do it until I have enough of a reference. Now, here's the problem. Even though you're cutting across the grain, I knocked the corner off. You can see how it's a little bit rough there. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But now when I put this piece, when I, when I put this piece over on here, I actually did the wrong one. I should have cut that one, but I had to do an example here. When I put this piece on, I would just move that over until that little ledge or that little wall lines up the two pieces. Well, that's fine. This is not a cheap plane. It went from being a couple hundred to almost four or five hundred now. But you always had to deal with that one piece of wood where the grain just would not cut well and it would tear. The other problem that you had to deal with is now that you have created a difference in the thickness of the piece, when you build your drawers, you have to allow for that. Because when I assemble this drawer and I put this piece on and this piece on, because there's a little rabbit cut right there, these, this internal dimension is going to be a little bit less because this, is, this internal dimension is going to come in a little bit farther because of that little rebate here and here. It's fine as long as you allow for that. But I find that any time I can eliminate things that I might easily forget, it's to my advantage. During the uh, lockdown phase of our lives, which I can't believe we endured, um, you couldn't get these. And yet people were wanting to do it. In fact, there was a huge surge in woodworking because it was something you could do at home. So Ken's son, who works as a son or son-in-law? Son. son. What, does he, what does he actually do? He worked for... He's for Napa Auto Parts. For it told us or, or told Ken about this tape. And this is called Automotive Refinishing Masking, Refinish Masking Tape. And what's nice about it is it's a little bit thicker than regular masking tape, and it has a little more stick. So what we would do is we would put four layers on top of each other so that part of the tape is on... In this case, the right side of that gauge line and the bulk of the tape is on the left side of the gauge line. Make sure it's well stuck. Take your knife and trim that off on both sides. Then you take your marking gauge that is set to the uh, dimension that you originally use when you were laying out your tails and you would come in and you would take one or two or three however many it took and then you would lift off that piece of tape now what that did is that provided you with a tape wall that would hold these two pieces perfectly aligned and you could move it side to side if you had to but it, it actually stuck I was I was very skeptical in the beginning but it turned out to work wonderfully and when you're done, you simply peel the tape off. You don't have to deal with any of those issues of having a rabbit cut on there. You don't have to deal with any of those issues of torn grain. So you can now buy these again, and I still think it's probably the best joinery plane to have. But do I use it? Not anymore. The tape method has won me over. It's far better. And we use this tape on a ton of stuff. It's, it's strong, but it doesn't leave a residue. And although it's sticky, you can get it off. I will warn you that if you put a clamp on it, then it really becomes difficult to remove. But we sell that stuff in two thicknesses, we, our widths. We sell it in... Yeah. I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to be without it. We, use, we go through a lot of it. Really good stuff. I don't know if Troy Clark is on, but Troy is... Uh, 
friend of ours, he plays goal for us. And uh, Angie gave me a gift that just happens to be a net that I think Troy could actually defend well. So I'll, I'll make sure Troy gets a chance to stand in front of that. Next, Frank. Uh, well, before we do next question, uh, there was an update from Charles. Uh, Charles was the guest that was on last week to tell us about uh, Eric Florip. You just want to give us an update that they've raised uh, over eighty thousand uh, dollars towards his family. Wow! Uh, so hold on a second. Let's back up a little bit. So, Charles, what's Charles' last name? Florp? No. Charles, his last name begins with an M. I can't remember what it is. Okay, so Eric Charles Florp was the vet. Was uh, uh, Air Force, Air Force or Army? Can't remember. Anyway, he got out. And uh, he started, he ended up making saws. He started off by... Eric, no, Eric is, Eric Florp is the guy who was in Eric, the air. Eric Florp is the vet. Ch yeah, Charles was the one that... Charles built, built the chest. Yes, okay. and gave us the story. Get our names right. So Eric, apologize. Eric started buying old saws, restoring them and selling them. Then he started making his own. Started a little bit of business. Not a little business, good business. And uh, not too long ago... He was diagnosed with, uh, I believe, a brain tumor, cancerous brain tumor. And uh, it turned out to be really serious, and he uh, can no longer work. So Charles, I don't know, took it upon himself, but decided to build a tool cabinet. A bunch of people donated tools, and then they were going to sell, raffle, raffle it off to help, and all the proceeds go to, uh, go to Eric's wife and daughter. Yes. I think. Yep. Help them out. So they contacted me and said, Rob, would you mind promoting this? I said, absolutely, we would do it. So last time we filmed, which is two weeks ago, we had them on and presented it. And now the results are. So what, what, have, we, what have they raised? I know they have a uh, GoFundMe. And then what are the ticket sales on the? $80,000 on the raffle. And a wow. uh, reminder that uh, the draw is tomorrow on James Wright's channel, YouTube channel. Okay, so the buy. ticket you can still buy tickets, and the tickets were five dollars a piece. I think so. Yeah, five dollars yeah. a piece, or you get a deal if you buy like right. hundred dollars worth, but very affordable. Eighty thousand—that's incredible. That—that's that's an incredible number. So James Wright on his YouTube channel—they're going to do the draw tomorrow. Why don't we do a draw for a prize now? We're half an hour in. Oh yeah, we are. Well, just tell me real quick, uh, do we have any combat wounded vets on? Yes. Let's say hello. Okay. And Frick, tell me if you can hear Ken. Yeah. Do you have a mic check? No, nope. nope. should be good. Uh, Wally Rao's on. Wally? <laughs> August 22nd. Wally's, Wally's uh, Air Force Canadian up in Ontario. Hi, Wally. Merry Christmas, brother. Uh, Ferris Butler. Ferris, Ferris Bueller. Bueller? Bueller. <laughs> Bueller. Bueller. the movie. So Ferris, um, Ferris, Ferris does a tremendous amount of work to help other vets. And I hear from him on a fairly regular basis, and he was in that far back corner. So nice to see you, Ferris. Keep working. You Phil, do a wonderful job. Phil Lawrence is on. Hi, Phil. Um, Phil, can't remember where Phil's from. 2018. Yeah, oh, wow, wow way back 2018. Yeah. Wow, uh, great Rick, to see you. Rick Elder's on. Hi, Rick. Rick is, uh, Rick's right here in Maine. So Rick was Night Stalkers 160th, I'm pretty sure, which was uh, Air Force. Well, actually, that's Army. That's Army, but it's the flying, the flying wing of Army. Same as Danny, Danny Bell. But Rick is a, is a leather craftsman as well as woodworker. And Rick, had, we've given several things away that uh, Rick has made and donated Good to see you, Rick. And Rick's also, i got to mention this. So every once in a while, something will happen. And uh, when we do our classes, we fly the, most of the guys into Bangor, Maine. Well, that's a three-hour three drive. And when you're trying to correlate seven, seven, air, seven flights for the vets plus Luther, and we always have a vet come back from a previous class to be our assistant. So eight flights trying to all get there at the same time. It never fails. Somebody gets, um, flight gets missed. And a couple of times I've had to call Rick and said, Rick, and he would more than happy to do it. Pick him up to Callis, bring him, uh, bring, pick him up in Bangor, bring him up to Callis for us. Rick, you're awesome, brother. Merry Christmas to you. Um, Mikhail Miller, May 23. Mike? 
I Miller don't know that. from Alberta. No, uh, didn't say where he's from. M I K E L L. Yeah, but that's. I think that's. I think that's Mike from El, from Alberta. Okay. And I apologize if it isn't Mike. If it is, it say something. Let me know. I try to remember. My old bean box is not. Kyle, Kyle, Kyle's on. Kyle, Kyle, who? The Newfie, Newfie Kyle, Kyle. Perel. Yeah. So Kyle is uh, one of the first two Canadians that we had. He and Jesse Rufians back in nineteen in two thousand seventeen. And Kyle was from Newfoundland and uh, fought in Afghanistan. Super guy, great friend. Kyle comes over on a whim and fills in to be our assistant. He's been here numerous times, and he'll be here many more. In fact, I expect us to have him over here three times next year. So big Merry Christmas to Kyle and his, and his wife and daughter over in Newfoundland shoveling snow. Jeff O'Connor's on. Jeff O'Connor. I know that name. Jeffrey. So Jeff O'Connor is a retired um, Navy EOD, worked with SEAL Team 6, and Jeff makes, I don't have a shave bowl. You know, Jeff, somebody, people, somebody almost every day tells me, I use that shave bowl every day. Who's telling, Rick? Me, Rick. Rick, yeah. My son-in-law, we all use Yeah. So Jeff does, yeah, check out O'ConnorWoodworking.com. And Jeff, oh, yeah, actually, Jeff's going to be on tonight. Did, Frick, did, did I tell you about that? Yes. Jeff, when are we going to do that? On, at, on the hour? Sure. Okay, no more talking about Jeff. Jeff's going to be on. Jeff, oh, I, I actually, i got to say it now so you can actually pump it up a little bit. So Jeff sells a lot of apparel, O'Connor Woodworking, and he's donating all of the sales. All of the sales for this month are being donated to the Purple Heart Project. Not the proceeds, all the sales. That deserves a big thumbs up. And he's such a wonderful guy because he's married to Kim. I'd throw that in. Eric is on. Who? Eric. Eric. Uh, I didn't get a last name. So I had several Eric's. I need a last name. Well, I wonder if it's Labine. Uh, Local Eric. Right. Eric, tell us where. Tell your last name. Anybody else? Uh, Casper. Casper. I was just. <laughs> So Casper was our uh, our one and only Great Dane. So that's the that's the Danish flag and Casper. So last year we had a vet from a combat wounded vet from Denmark. We had one from Ireland. Had one from Australia. The rest were from uh, United States and Canada. But Casper came all the way from Denmark. He said in the comments he needs to get you a bigger flag. I already did. I already got it. I already got it. I bought. I had uh, I bought a flag to represent every country that we represent. And they're going to hang on that wall over there. So I already got it. I got it about a month ago. It's sitting over there on the table. Good to see you, Casper. Uh, Glad you stayed up. Mike Delbois. Hey, Mike. Mike is in. I, Jake always helped me, but I remember Mike. Jo uh, Howdy, Beck. Mike. John Beck. John Beck. John Beck goes all the way back to the Vietnam War. Also known as Santa Claus. He looks like him. Good to have you here, John. Merry Christmas to you. Speaking of Santa Claus, the Santa Claus and Mrs. Santa are on. Oh, I knew they would be. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy. The, the, I was taught. I was taught the true value of giving. Should we go to a commercial? No. <laughs> By a man that we call Santa Claus. Never met him. Never even spoken to him on the phone. We've ever, only ever communicated through email. And he has been sending me money, thousands of dollars, thousands of dollars. In fact, tens of thousands of dollars. Just to give tools away to make people happy. To bring vets to the, uh, to the program. Thank you for the lesson. Next. Um. Jimmy can Kevin Burris. Jim's on? Jim's on, yeah. I always love to tell Jim's story. This is the most incredible. Uh, every time there's a... Oh, okay. Frick's telling me to hurry up. Why am I having to hurry up? Well, you're... you're this thinking, is a oh, great story. Okay. No, I'm, this I'm not this story. story specifically, but this whole... So thing you always think long. about uh, medical marvels when they... These guys. So Jim was riding on the driver's side of an unarmored Humvee 
on the driver's side but in the passenger. And they always tend to blow it up in the front, but this one ended up in the back, so he took all the brunt of it. And it damaged all the nerves on the side of his face, so his eye lid wouldn't work. Wouldn't work. So you know what they did? They inserted a little gold bar in his eyelid. So he can open his eye, and the, the gravity closes the eyelid. So if you look really close, you'll see this little gold, you'll see this little rectangle in his eyelid that closes. I, think, I just think, you know, some, that surgeon had to have been a woodworker in order to come <laughs> up with that kind of ingenuity. Jim, wasn't there a James Bond golden eye or golden Yeah, there was finger? a golden eye and gold golden finger. Eye? Well, that's, that's Jim. I asked his permission to tell the story because I just find it absolutely fascinating. Kevin Burris is on. Kev. Kevin Burris. This is Kev. Kevin is a uh, 22-year uh, Army EOD blown up multiple times, more than you can count. And Kevin's business is Burris Woodworking, B-U-R-A-S Woodworking. And Kevin does laser engraving on granite and on, on uh, slate. These are slate. I prefer the slate. So he's making me one. I hope he's making me one that says, we're going to put it up over there for the boys. Second place means you're the number one loser. We don't ever want to, we don't ever want to be second place. I thought that was a great quote. Came right out of Seinfeld, Frick, you tell me? I can't remember. Second place means you're the number one loser. Or the first loser. Something like that. Who else? Ken? That's it. Okay, Frick, go ahead. All right, let's do a couple draws. I have to keep looking over here because I have to, I have to keep an eye on the time because uh, Frick demands that we stay on time. Well, we got so many prizes to give away. We well, how many, how many people are on? Uh, right now we have 537. 537. And everybody's registered? You've been... We've got uh, 4467 and, and 4100 so far. And we had 1200 from last time. So. How much do we have? 4100 in donations so far? 5300. 5300? Last, last time... Last time we didn't do the draw, we were going to bring it forward to this time. Yeah. Well, we'll include that in all these gifts then. Yeah. If I give away any more than that, I don't have anything left. Okay. What, what, where, uh, let's give away two. We two? Get, well, yeah, okay. we're almost 45. So let's give away Ian. Can I say his last name? McMath, yeah. Ian McMath works here. How long has Ian been with us? Three years. Three years. And Ian does an impeccable job at making, he makes all of our saws now. He's a quick study. So these, now this is mine, but this one's new in the box. So this is our dovetail saw, and this is our new handle. I can't say any more than that or I'll get in trouble. But there's our, there's the new handle, this dovetail saw. Who are we send it to? Okay, give me a Gina, second. is Gina on? Is Gina's taking, recording all this, I think? Um, well, she can go back on the video. It's, are you ready? Yeah. That is going to... I'm going to write on it, and I'll sign it, too. Drum roll. That's going to Kent Yarnell in Los Angeles, California. Kent in, La in Los Angeles? Yes, sir. Well, this whole, this whole Purple Heart thing we do at its roots in Los Angeles, that's where Jesse Paradis is from. He's the vet that inspired me to start all of this. I can't find a Sharpie, so there goes that idea. I'll put it down underneath here. If we can find a Sharpie between now and whenever, I'll sign that box and put his name on it. Who, what's his name? Kent. Kent. Congratulations, Kent. Use it well. I want to see the first dovetail. Thank you. So, Kent. Y-A-R-N-E-L-L? Y-A-R-N-E-L-L, yes. Merry Christmas. There you go, brother. Be in the mail on Wednesday. We're giving away one more? Yeah. Okay, let's give away a 12-inch. Uh, I said six the other night. 12-inch combina uh, uh, um, PEC combination square. All right. Two-two. That's going to... In case, you want, in case you're interested, that was a... $275 gift. How much is this one, Ken? 12-inch combination square. Who's it going to, Frick? Colin Wilson in Victoria, Australia. 
Ah, Colin, down under. Not much room to sign anything on there. There you go, Colin. That'll be in the mail for you on Wednesday, brother. Next question. All right, next question comes from Leah in the chat. Hi, Leah. She says, if, you're starting, if you were starting out with hand tools, what would be the first plane you recommend, and why would this be your, the one you chose? Thanks. If I was starting out with hand tools, what would be the first plane I'd recommend, and, and uh, why? I'm sorry, what did she say besides? Yeah, and why would this be the one you chose? Why? Okay, so the first plane. Now, first of all, you have to understand I have access to all the planes, but this is the one I use 90% of the time, Ken. I used to say 85. It's probably 90 or 95%. So why? Well, if we, uh, I'm going to quickly lay out what would be the most common. So there's your smoother. There's your jointer. And this one's in the middle, referred to as a jack. So the problem with this, well, it's really good at smoothing. It's no good in the shooting board. And the shooting board, we're giving one away tonight. The shooting board requires length and weight. And that doesn't have either one. So trying to use this effectively when you're passing the blade through a, uh, a piece of maple or a piece of oak, it just doesn't have the oomph behind it. The best plane for that job is actually the jointer because it has lots of mass, lots of length. The problem is this is a very cumbersome plane to use on the bench, what I might call general purpose. This suits that job well, but it's lousy on the shooting board. The jack plane is long enough to be effective on the shooting board, short enough to be general purpose really well, really good. So that is my favorite. David Charles returned me onto that. Um, I like the five and a half versus the five. The five and a half uses a blade that's two and three eighths inch wide. The five uses a blade that is only two inches wide. When you learn how to sharpen, you'll understand it's no harder to push that blade through the wood than it is to push a two inch blade through the wood, which just means you get to do a little more work with, you, with each stroke. Um, it's got the weight, the length, the width that makes me happy. The only exception to that rule, if you're a very slight female or male, you may want to consider a five. Um, not, that, uh, not that Omar was, was uh, unable to do it, but Omar was badly blown up. So he's had a lot of muscle atrophy in his hands because of the injuries. So I gave him a five and a half, but then I went and I got him a five. And oh, he said, oh yeah, this is a lot easier to use, Rob. So we, we set him off home with a five. So five and a half would be the plane. I would outfit it without question with the adjust star. It'll make a world of difference in the way that it works. I would switch out the screws. Jake's idea was to, to uh, replace all those slotted screws with a hex drive, which just only makes sense. It doesn't slip. All five of the main screws are done that way. And Jake also came up with the, uh, the grip. When you're using it on the shooting board, the problem with all of these planes is that nobody really planned for this. So even though you can use it on its edge, there's really no provision for your hand. And Ken will tell you, if you spend any amount of time shooting, your hand will be raw just because of the way you have to hold it. So Jake had this idea, spent a year or two developing this. It's made out of cast aluminum, and that fits on there. And point at him and ask, he has, he has a camera. Ask him what he thinks, because he was probably the first person to use it for any amount of time. It's a game changer. If you do much uh, work on the shooting board, it's incredible. Saves your hand, makes it a more pleasurable experience. And you'll also notice that it's right beside the blade, so it gives you tons of control. It's right exactly where you want it to be, and it's just, it is that. You have to drill a hole in your plane, so if you're worried about that, you're a collector, not a user. It has a magnet in it just to help hold a little bit better, but that brass pin fits right in there. There's two little round-headed set screws to take out any slop so it doesn't move at all on you, and it just works extremely well. Five and a half. We're going to give away one tonight. Let's do it now, Frick. We're going to give a we're going to give away a five and a half, and it's fully loaded. That means with the five and a half, it's already got the adjuster on it. It's got the hex screws on it. When we sell a plane, we Rick does this. Rick Irvin. 
So he flattens the sole, squares the side, sharpens the blade, prepares the back of the uh, prepares the back of the chip breaker, prepares the back of the la of the uh, lever cap, does the back of the blade obviously, drills it. We drill it for the adjust hour. So if you're left hand or right hand, we'll adjust accordingly. So we're going to include in that. Not only are you getting the plane, we're also going to give you the uh, the grip. So that's a really nice prize. It probably has a value of, Ken? I don't know. I don't keep that stuff in my head. I'm going to say it's getting close to $500. Yeah. It's a big prize. By the way, uh, Michael Miller said that uh, he was a veteran in a May 2023 class in which Rob and Luther made faces at each other when I was given my story. I'm sure he'll remember now. <laughs> you remember now? <laughs> oh, oh my, oh yeah, it's coming to me. Mm, Mike. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I think it might have been a long story. I remember. Who are we giving this to, Frick? This is where, so we normally are restricted. We can't sell five and a halfs into the United States, but this is a prize, so we can send this anywhere we want. So hopefully an American will get it. Five and a half, fully loaded with the grip. It's going to Paul Testoni in East Greenwich. That's Connecticut? Rhode East Island. Greenwich, or is that New York? Rhode Island. Rhode Island, I knew it was on the East Coast. Paul, congratulations, Paul. That's a big prize, brother. You'll love it. Should we do, do should we do two since I'll uh, should we do two since we're doing it, Frick? Yep. I'll, I'll uh, I don't know whether he's left-handed or right-handed, so I'll sign whichever one we're sending to him once we find that out. So, Paul, I need to know if you're left-handed or right-handed. What are we giving away next? Um, let's give away uh, a Kerfix ten. This is for when you cut half-blind dovetails. This allows you to go in and complete the cut. All right, ready? Yep. Here we go. The winner is Emma Lowry in Glasgow, Scotland. Oh, Emma in Scotland. Emma. No. No, that's their prize. Congratulations, Emma. Be in the mail on Wednesday. Oh. If anybody's watching that control the reason why I'm going to get a haircut, please expedite it. Next, Rick. All right. This is a question from Hamed. Hamed? No, Hamed. Oh, Hamed. He says, what's the most effective way to prevent rust on my tools? Despite using wax, the high humidity still causes them to rust. No, no. No, what you want is to get a plain sock. sock. So that's a resin impregnated. I'll show you just some of the stuff. So, uh, Jake went to work on this. So we're, having, we're going to have these ones made for your saws. So you put your saw in there, and this material is called... Oh, do you remember the, the acronym for it? But it's some kind of a rust inhibitor in the material. So you put your saw in there, close that, and it'll keep the rust off it. They make the same thing, only a, sa a sock for your plane. There's four different sizes, so you're going to want the uh, you're going to want the third the, the third large. The, there's if we go small, medium, large, extra large, you're going to want the large for five and a half. And you simply put that in your put it in, zip, uh, pull the drawstring, and take it out when you want it. And then you never have to wipe off any oil or wax or anything. It is the best way to go, and they're not that expensive. What are they? Ten dollars ish plane socks. Even if they're twenty dollars, so what? Get it it's on the website. I gotta start thinking, paying attention to the good questions. Next, Frick. Did you get anything to eat? Did you bring a new? Uh... Yeah, you better go now before they leave. Go get your dinner. Tell them this to save me some. They would, please. They're going skating. Skating? Yes. All right. This next one's from Dave Engstrom in the chat. Hi, Dave. What stone grits do I need for sharpening chisels? Well, 
uh, so I gotta, I gotta qualify this answer. If you're just sharpening chisels, then you need to start with a core stone, 500 or 1,000. I use 1,000, Jake likes 500. And then you're gonna finish. And your finish is 16,000. And my argument for that is, it's not that much more expensive than the 8,000. It lasts just as long, but it gives you a far better edge. So the 16,000 Shapton, which we're giving away a whole sharpening kit tonight. So this, which is the premium diamond plate, it's double-sided. It's got a 1,000 grit and it's got a 300 grit. This stone, which is the 16,000, sits on the holder. You need the holder. Don't argue, just get it. And because this stone wears, you have to maintain its flatness. And you do that with the 300 grit side of this stone. And it takes a diamond in order to cut the ceramic. So that's how it works. Now, if you are starting from scratch, meaning these are new chisels, you've got to do the back. If you want it to work expertly, you've got to polish the back. That means you've got to start, you've got to go from, you got to flatten and then move that polish level up to 16,000. You can't go 1,016 on the back of a chisel because it's a very large surface. So then you're going to add to that kit a 6,000 at a bare minimum. You're even better to go 1,000, 4,000, 8,000, 16. Just gonna, it actually will be faster in the long run. But the problem is those in-between stones, once you're done that, they don't get used again. So I think a little extra work and you can go 6,000. So 1,000, 6,000, 16. That'll do your back. Sam I M wants to know, does 30,000 do anything to improve your edges? Yeah, it does. Um, however, if you have the money, by all means, get it. You'll love it. It'll it'll make the back of it'll make the back of your chisel look like a single surface mirror. It's amazing. The problem is it uh, it is double the price of a sixteen thousand grit stone, and uh, it only stands the reason that if you're going from scratching the steel with a 16,000 grit particle up to scratching it with a 30,000, of course it's going to be better. But the law of diminishing return kicks in and you'll get to a point where you can no longer determine the difference with your naked eye or your hand. And if you go, if you get to that point, then going beyond that no longer makes sense because there's no perceived benefit. Even though the benefit's there, you can't see it, you can't feel it. So... We sell this at 30000 I love it. I would use it. But I would come back and say, if you, are, if you work with a budget, you would be better off buying another saw or another chisel or a plane instead of going from the sixteen to the 30000 in terms of where am I going to spend my money the wisest. That was a good question. That deserves a T-shirt. Who's, who's this going to? Uh, who, who asked that? I don't know if my mic was muted when I said it, but it's Sam I am. Sam I am? Yep. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sign right up here beside Angie. Sam. I signed right above Angie's A. So, Sam, that T-shirt's coming to you. Good question, brother. Next, Frick. We might have to go late just to give all this stuff away. That's okay. We won't have any email. We'll be closed Wednesday. Can't be one of anything to sell. Have to bring the boys back overtime, make some more tools. Next. Uh, Ash uh, Gillis in the chat. Ash. Have you ever considered using the dowel hinge for cupboard drawers? Cupboard doors. Have I? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I have a cabinet. Uh, it's on Ken's bench. It got destroyed eventually, but I built it way back in 19, 1985. It was a pine cabinet. And somebody wrenched the door off, but yes. Yeah, you can do that. It uh, works wonderfully. Uh, Alan Jachovitz says, how do you sharpen mortise chisels? Hi, Alan. How do you sharpen mortise chisels? Well, you do it, well, there's a couple of ways. This chisel is used with a lot of blunt force, meaning you're wailing away on that with your mallet. So it's not, I wouldn't call it a finesse tool like you do a beveled edge chisel. So for that reason, it probably doesn't need to be as sharp as a beveled edge. But if you want, you can go in and polish the back, polish the sides, and do your little primary bevel, or your little tertiary bevel. 
This is actually what does the cutting right here and right there. But like I said, because of the way that it works and the application, I don't see the, I don't see the value in spending a lot of time polishing those sides. But Jake does mine for me, and you'll see some of them where he's gone in and put a, put a mirror polish on the back. Next, Frick. Uh, Kentucky Iron. Kentucky Iron? Kentucky. That's how he spells it. And the chat says, why do we never see Rob do string inlay? Oh, haha. <laughs> Well, uh, David Charlesworth answered that question well once. He showed me a piece of furniture. He said, you really have to think 20 years down the road. What's this going to look like when the wood oxidizes? And David had built this table, and it had this beautiful string in inlay that just, you know, painstaking amount of time that went into it. And when the wood oxidizes, because all wood will oxidize. And when I say that, what I mean is... Um, the mahogany is going to get darker. The walnut is going to get, is going to get, I've got a, I got a box out there that I hate the color of it now. Walnut tends to get a gray brown. Oak and maple yellow. Um, poplar gets kind of a, uh, a greenish whitish gray. You can imagine that. Cherry gets dark and then if there's too much UV light, it'll go blonde. Uh, any of the any of the exotics will get really dark, like rosewood, to the point where you can't even you can't see any grain. Pine is the best in terms of how it ages. It gets this beautiful honey patina. So I did. Where's that cabinet? Oh, I'll show you. Hold on. This is going to be a great object lesson. It's right here. So way back in uh, 2002 or three, the very first advanced class I taught, which by the way, we're gonna have three advanced classes this coming year. Very first advanced class I taught, I, we did a, um, a hall table and it had a drawer on either end. You see the dovetails out here? Can you see them, Ken? No. Yeah. Frick, can you see the dovetails? Yep, oh, those ones, uh, we can now, yep. You can? Yeah. Go back a little bit. Go back from what we're... Not, you can see them good in the back, but not yeah, in the, the front. So what I didn't realize is that the end grain of the bird's eye maple and the face grain of the mahogany would eventually get to a point where they, it was the exact same shade. You can't see it. You open those drawers, and you can't, unless you get the light just right, you cannot see the dovetail at all. So why don't I do string inlay? Because there's a good chance that... In time, you're not going to be able to see it. So um, I, I try to tell people, when you're building something, you, you've got to get past just the wood, the contrast of the uh, different woods or the wood itself, because a lot of that is going to fade in time. So make sure that your proportions are such that it's pleasing to look at, and you got to put a, build a little bit of detail into it that's going to go beyond just the superficial color. It's like marrying a woman for who she is instead of what she looks like. Would that be a good example? Don't even go there. Oh, don't go there. Okay. <laughs> good advice. Good <laughs> advice? Next, Rick. Uh, next one comes from uh, hey, Field like Him. Pardon? I don't know how to say the name. Field Him O'Shea from Ireland. He says, would you recommend buying cheap tools and working up to expensive tools, or would you buy expensive tools? Oh, one he time? just wants a T-shirt. <laughs> Send that man a t-shirt. What? Let's get his name right. So it's spelled F-E-I-D. F-E-I-D. H-L-I-M. F-E-I-D. H-L-I-M. That was a loaded question. T-shirt's on its way to Ireland? Yeah, so whoever wins a t-shirt... Uh, who's not in the draw, make sure you email support at robcosman.com to give him your address. That sounds like a Gina note. It is. It is a Gina note. And your size. Never buy cheap tools. Why would you buy it twice? Never buy cheap tools. If you buy cheap tools, 
Two things, two things have the potential of happening. One, the tool will so discourage you that you'll quit. Or two, you'll stick with it and you'll eventually get to the point where you realize the reason I couldn't do this is because that lousy piece of crap tool I bought. Now you've got to go buy the one you should have bought, which just added to the price. So if you're committed and you're going to do this, buy the best. You only cry once. You buy junk, you cry every time you use it. You buy the best, you'll smile every time you use it. Bad, bad plan. And people say that to me all the time. Oh, I'll get a good one when I get better. You won't get better. The tool is the most important part of the process. And everybody wants to argue, say, no, no, it's the craftsman. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. You look at this. I was showing Shane earlier. This is, this is Omar. Omar is blown up, leg blown off, all the meat blown off another leg, fingers blown off, whole forearm was blown off, lost his elbow, they rebuilt the elbow, and that guy was able to cut a dovetail like that. And you try to tell me that that was his skill? He could barely hold the saw. These two fingers did not work. There was nothing left down in here. They just hung there. He's trying to hold a dovetail saw with what's left of two fingers and a thumb. And he pulled off a joint like that. Why? Well, not only did he have tremendous tenacity, but he had a great saw. And I hate to take away anything from you, Omar, but... The saw is the reason. The saw is the reason why that and that and that and that are first time dovetails. No people don't believe me when I say that, but that saw will enable you to do a perfect dovetail in the first week of trying. In the I first day if you come here. In the chat said to send you a t shirt for that epic rant. <laughs> <laughs> I am wearing mine. I was ready. Yeah. It's been one of those weeks. Next Frick. Uh, Are we doing a flyby still? Good job, Bert. Unlike my other cameraman who prefers to sit over there and leave that on the tripod, he shall remain nameless. Is Jake on? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> That's right. He'll never watch it. Next, Frank. Uh, this is J uh, John Spicer from Class 25. Hi, John. He says, with the MDF benchtop, what can be done to remove damage? Can you plane it, or can the damage be filled with something like epoxy? No. So here's what we do. After every class, we go out, and it's inevitable. Somebody's going to nick it with the saw, the chisel. So MDF has a very hard and well-wearing top surface. But as soon as you get below the surface, you get into some softer material. So get yourself a bottle of cyanacrylate. Shoot. That shouldn't have been tipped over. Get yourself a bottle of cyanacrylate. Somewhere I have one here that has the, uh, well, here it is down here. It comes in three consistencies. Uh, one that is the consistency of water. One that is the consistency of maple syrup. Of course, I'd use that example. And one has the consistency of uh, molasses. So what you do is you go over to that damaged area with your thin cyanacrylate. And by the way, Jake found these. You can, what are these called, Ken? Do you remember? Wow. There's a name for these little tips that you can, you can buy oh. to put on there. But it's great because you can actually put it exactly where you want it. And you just saturate that area. And when it hardens, it'll stiffen it right up. Works beautifully. If it's a big, deep gouge, you could easily fill it with uh, sawdust and cyanacrylate or even, I would probably do that. Sawdust, MDF sawdust and cyanacrylate, level it off, or, you know, pack it in, put the cyanacrylate on it, and then uh, flush it up afterwards. And you can, you can cut it with the plane. Next, Frick. Let's do a prize. Do a prize? Yeah. Luther's sending me some more questions, so I want to... All right, what do, we, what do we got? We have, this is a really big prize. This is two, two saws, a pair Rip and a cross cut. We still have another Curfix 10. We have this another big prize that's sharpening. Let's do this one. So this is made by Ken Ant none other than Ken Anthony. So Ken makes these prep tools, both of them in here, for doing your scrapers. So here's a pair of our scrapers. One's 20 thou and one's 32 thou. I think that's what it is. And there's the holder, the sleeve. So one blade goes in one side, one goes in the other. And there's your tools for prepping it. And that has a value of... Make something up. 
I'm going to say about 150. It's priceless. Huh? Priceless. Priceless, yes. So let's give this away. Who's it going to? Uh, give me one second here. All right. It is going to Tim Tibby in Kansas. Tim T. Tim, it's on its way, brother. Congratulations. We'll put it in the mail for you on Wednesday. Want to do one more, Frick? Sure. Okay, let's do a drawer bottom plane. So, uh, my, uh, my history with uh, Wounded Vets goes back to 2016 when we started this. And um, these guys put it all on the line for us. They don't know us. So when they come home wounded and unable to take care of themselves because of scars from the battlefield, it's our responsibility. The government, does, the government is pathetic. Don't get me on that. But we're the ones that benefit directly, so we should be the ones that are offering the help. So not only do we uh, bring them into the class, but if I can employ them somehow... Al, Al McNeil works here. Al was a uh, ret uh, Strathcona, retired uh, as a tank commander. That was the first round that he ever fired. Blown up in his last tour in Afghanistan by a suicide bomber. Um, uh, Sid works here. What's Sid? What's Sid's last name? I know him as Sid. Yeah, it's John. Borden. <laughs> Boy, Sid Borden. Borden. Sorry, Sid. Sid works here. Sid, 32 years, combat engineer. Um, so we have, uh, well, the, there was two vets, two Canadian vets came to our program in the 2017. One was Kyle over Newfoundland. The other was Jesse Rufianch. And, uh, Jesse was injured when that American A-10, that friendly fire incident and fired on a group of Canadians, not knowing that they were friendly. Ar so, Benson is oh, Artis is really Dave's mom. Artis. Merry Christmas. So... We get Jesse to make some of the stuff that we do. And Jesse, and uh, I tell him all the time, I said, Jess, I don't throw compliments around carelessly. Jesse, I think, is, is w uh, very possibly the best craftsman I know. And he makes these, and these are flawless. And these are finished right from the hand plane. He does exceptional work. So he makes panel gauges now. So the panel gauges will be up on the website soon. He makes the drawer bottom planes. Pretty soon we're going to have match sets, meaning you'll have a right and a left. So that'll be cool. So let's give away one of, uh, one of these drawer bottom planes. Some lucky son of a gun is going to get it. So you want to do the draw, Frick? It's going. Jesse, if you're on, Merry Christmas, brother. It's going to Shane Steiger in British Columbia. Another Shane. S-H-A-N-E? Correct. Correct. And where is Shane in BC? Yep. Where? Just says BC. Oh, BC. There you go, brother. Be in the mail for you on uh, Wednesday. And then it goes in the hands of Canada Post. Good luck with that. <laughs> Next, Frick. <clears throat> All right. This one comes from Jerry Sarkozy in the chat. Hi, Jerry. I know that name. He says, when adjusting the frog, approximately what is the opening size to get thin shavings? Well, Jerry... Adjusting the frog doesn't have anything to do with getting thin shavings. Adjusting the frog, and what he's referring to is, if I take the lever cap off and the blade and chipper, chipper, blade and chip breaker out, this is the frog. This is a piece of metal that's attached to the sole of the plane, and its job is to park the blade at 45 degrees and to hold it securely so it doesn't move. When you get into a situation where you're planing figured wood, like the front of this drawer front, this bird's eye, now you're no longer planing the wood following the grain direction. It's turning and twisting multiple times. Has the propensity to lift up and tear. You can't change direction because it would be impossible. You'd have to change direction 100 times across that board. But what you can do is you can take your frog and you can move it forward. I'll demonstrate. Now... I, uh, I was telling you about uh, the upgrade we do now with the uh, hex drive. So 
One of the screws that we replace is this one, which is so much easier. This problem with the slot screw is they tend to slip. These don't. So in the little kit, which I think is $11, you get that screw between the blade and the chip breaker. You get this screw, which holds the lever cap down on top. You get these three screws back here, which I'll show you what they do momentarily. So I've got my blade in my plane. I've got it parallel to the sole and just projecting enough that I would probably take a shaving maybe a thousandth of an inch or a little less, okay? And I have a gap. It's really tight, so I'm going to open it up a little bit. What I need, I, I have the flexibility of being able to move this or open or close this gap all the while maintaining the same thickness of shaving. What it does is it controls the tear out by simply applying pressure. So when I'm going over the board, this part of the sole of the plane at the point of the arrow puts pressure on the wood fiber directly ahead of the blade. So if the blade tries to lift the fiber up, it can't because this is holding it down. Now, you want that, but not all the time. The reason is it restricts how much shaving you can take out. You have very, very thin pass. If I've got to remove a lot of material, I, I, need to, I want to take a heavy shaving. So what I would do is I'd go in here. Nice thing about the adjust R, it allows you to get access to these screws. Nice thing about the ball hex, we sell these, is that you can get at it from an angle. So you just take about a quarter of a turn is all it takes to loosen it. Everything is intact, meaning you haven't had to remove anything here. Take that center screw, and as you turn it back, you open up the gap. When you get it where you want it, you snug up the two outside frog retaining screws, readjust your blade so that you're getting the shaving that you want, and go to work. If it has to come back to another situation where you're needing a tight control, then you just move it forward. But the fact that this is a bedrock style plane, copied after the Stanley Baileys that were a bedrock, means that you don't have to take anything apart and you can very accurately set that gap. But you don't want the gap too tight for regular work because you're limited in the thickness of your shaving. You don't want the gap too big for fine work because it won't control the tear out. It only works in controlling tear out when it literally is, essent or is essentially matching the thickness of the shaving, meaning the gap and the thickness of the shaving are about the same. That was a good question. We'll send you a t-shirt. Who's that going to? Uh, whoops. Where was it? I deleted it after. Jerry what? Sarkozy. Who? Jerry Sarkozy. Jerry with a G or a J? A J. Hey, Jerry. T-shirt's on its way. Next, Frick. Uh, next one is from John Donat Donati. John Donati, I know John. Hi, yeah, John. He says, do you ever use miter box plane? Um, yeah, we have, we set up, we, I bought a, I bought a nice little miter gauge, an old, an old one. Where is it? It's right here. Oh, I got to fix the, I got to fix the plane, the, uh, I got to fix the, uh, instead of having guys when they're practicing their dovetails, Instead of having them come in and use a power chop saw, heaven forbid, we set up a miter box right up there, and they got to come in and use a miter box. So, yes, I do use a miter box, and I do use a miter box saw, but that's never going to give you, that's never going to give you a finished cut. It'll get you close. So then I come in, and I use our, somewhere here, I'm looking at it and not seeing it. Somewhere in here I have a, a shooting board that is designed to cut a 45-degree miter. I don't know where it is. But, yeah, I, I, I use a shooting board. I use a, a, a miter gauge, but miter box, but not, not terribly often. Next, Rick. Uh, Brendan Collins in the chat says, I went to Brendan. SAIT in Calgary. What is your favorite memory from SAIT? From where did he go? S-A-I-T? Oh, there? SAIT. Yeah. Yeah. He went there. Yeah, and you said, what's your favorite memory from there? Uh, well, I didn't go there. I used to teach there, but I didn't teach there on their curriculum. I went there. 
they would let me rent the facility and I would teach classes all summer that I ran myself. Um, my favorite memory from SATE. So when I was there, it was, I think it was an old liquor, liquor, provincial liquor commission or something. Big, huge building. Had multiple shops. It was a huge facility. Uh, probably uh, um, the people that were there that ran it. They were, they were so good to me. They would literally give me the keys and say, just lock up at night when you go. So we'd get in there as early as we want. We'd stay as late as we want. Great facility. Had big old benches that were fantastic. Um, not a fan of Calgary weather. First time I taught there, August 1st, they got seven centimeters of snow. American students used to call and say, well, what clothes should I bring? I said, everything you have. So the people, it was great people. And I, and I, love, the, I love the air of prosperity. I love taking my kids out there. You could have made a fortune just selling help wanted, uh, making help wanted signs because it was everywhere. The economy was booming. It was a great. So they have such a can-do at, attitude. It's, it's fantastic. But I like water. I like being around the water. I like looking at the mountains, but I'd rather be by the water. The people. Final answer. Any more vets, Ken? Ken? Uh, Tim, Tim Pierce, September 20th. Hi, Tim. Vietnam era, Tim. And uh, thank you for the little note the other day, Tim. You're fantastic. Jeff speaks highly of you. I speak highly of you. Just an awesome, awesome guy. Thanks, Tim. Merry Christmas. Oh, wait, wait where's Jeff? We're going to bring Jeff on. Can you arrange that right now? Uh, yeah, give me a minute. We'll okay, well, you give me another question while you're doing that. Looter in a Riot wants to know... Who? His username is Looter in a Riot. Looter in the Riot? He's here with us every week. He's, he's always on. When is the new website launching? I want to buy a wood hinge box. When is the new... Oh. Yeah. Well, we're working on it. We ran into a pothole. We're working on it. Email me. Email me. Rob at robcosman.com. I'm going to give away a box tonight. Maybe you'll win it. Next question, Frick. Um, oh, that was worth a t-shirt. <laughs> Looter in the Riot. You're on here all the time. i got to recognize you. Looter in just, the Riot. Just put Looter. Looter, Looter in a Riot? In a Riot. Oh. <laughs> you get himself thrown in jail. <laughs> just put Looter. Looter. <laughs> here you go, Looter. It's on its way, brother. Next. Uh, splinters from the chat. Splinters, that's a good, that's a good, uh, <laughs> that's a good word working. You want a seat? You can grab one out there if you want. Does the shooting grip fit any brand of plane? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's very simple. Let me explain this real quick. So here's how it works. There are two set screws. Yeah, come in close, Irv. There are two little set screws, and they're oval. They're called oval head set screws. They're brass. See them right there? So what you do is you, you wind them out a little bit, and then you put this. Oh, let me show this. You, and th this is a, a, a pretty snug fit. So you unscrew or you pull in this brass pin. Pull it in until it's flush. Then you're going to position this where you want it. Now, I recommend that you have it very close to the blade, but you've got to find where it feels comfortable. When you get it there, there's an eighth-inch diameter hole down through the middle of this, this brass pin. So holding that in place, you take your drill, eighth-inch drill, and you drill a pilot hole into your plane. Then, and we sell a little, we, we sell a little kit of drills... It has an uh, eighth-inch drill, a quarter-inch drill, and a countersink. And these are called split-point drills, so they don't have a tendency to wander like it often does when you try to do that on metal. And the countersink is a really good countersink. And you can you go to your drill press. If you can't go to your drill press, then you got to be able to, you got to get a nice, nice perpendicular block. you got to get a piece of wood, drill a hole that's perpendicular, and use that as a guide. Drill press is better. Drill your hole down in there. It's only 3 sixteenths of an inch deep quarter inch diameter then you're going to take your you're going to take your uh countersink and just kind of it's just a little shallow countersink not very much yeah, at all this question then once you do that you're going to wind this back in 
like so. And you're going to put this in place. Now, your little set screws, in order to get this to fit just right, may need to come out a little bit, or they may need to take up a little bit of slot, but you don't want any movement in that. You want it nice and snug. So what I always do is I run it down like this, move it over until it drops in place, and it's ready to go. So as long as you have a side that is square to the sole, you can make that fit. All right, Jeff's ready. Can I see him over there? Yep. So I'm gonna let uh, I'm gonna let Jeff do all the talking because uh, he doesn't get to say much at home. He's <laughs> Jeffrey. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are you doing? Just dandy. Take over. Tell him what you're doing. Well, hi everybody. First of all, I just want to say Merry Christmas to everybody out there. And this is a pretty cool night with uh, all the giveaways and uh, some great information from Rob. So. If you guys don't know me out there, um, I attended Rob's course back in 2019, and I was a, a combat wounded Navy EUD technician, and uh, I was blessed to go to the course. And ever since that time, my life has changed. You know, I, I, it changed dramatically during the course, and inspired me actually to start O'Connor Woodworking. And my whole my whole retirement plan was to train bomb squads around the country, and after going to Rob's course and realizing that the, the, the peace of mind I got through woodworking, I decided that I was going to completely shift the plan of my life. And it was the best decision I've ever made, I think. So, you know, every year I try to figure out a way that I can do something to give back to Rob. So for, for uh, this year, what I wanted to do was try to raise money through my website and I started uh, December 1st, so for the entire month of December, all of my apparel sales, which also includes a couple of Rob Cosmos shirts with a magical profile of Rob's <laughs> hair on one of the shirts, if you guys purchase any O'Connor Woodworking apparel off my website, I'm going to give the entire purchase price to Rob and the Purple Heart Project. So um, it's not 10% of the proceeds. It's not hundred percent of the proceeds. It's, it's whatever you're paying for that shirt or hat or apron, whatever it is you're getting. Um, I'm going to donate that to the project. So I'm hoping, hoping that we can dig deep in our pockets and help out. This organization has done so much for so many veterans out there, including myself. So I've got multiple guys I know that have gone through the course and every single one of them has been touched in a very special way. And I think it's the best way to, to uh, to help with chronic PTSD and a lot of the other ailments that we have without the drugs, without the counseling, and just being able to go into your shop and have that peace. So thank you, Rob. Thank you to the family and everything you do. And and uh, please get out there. O'ConnorWoodworking.com is the website. And Kim is working feverishly getting these shirts out. So what can you lose? You get a cool shirt, and all that money is going to Rob. So Thank Jake, you for all you do, Rob. Merry Christmas. Jake wants to know if all the shirts you sell are padded like the one you're wearing. <laughs> this is actually my, this is the extra small. I love it. As Super Dave used to say, this medium. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me, Rob. And, and thank you for all your supporters out there. And uh, you're doing great things for all of us. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Jeffrey. Where's Kim? She's in the shop working, getting those shirts. Oh, out. of course. Yeah, she's got <laughs> no you time off. The shop and the TV there. Hi, <laughs> Kim. <Take care. laughs> See you, Jeff. Thank you. So Jeff and Kevin and Kim and I meet. We used to do it three times a week. We meet twice a week for an hour and uh, Zoom call, and uh, we uh, we mentor each other in business, which is fantastic. Uh, they think they've got a lot out of it. I've got a ton out of it. Next, Rick. What's what's double duty? Uh, okay, so this one comes from Walter Rao. He says, how do, you, "How do you clean the wax buildup on your plane after so many applications?" Uh, I use my plane so that it wears off. I've never actually had it build up, if you're talking about it on the sole, because uh, it, it wears off. That's why you have to constantly reapply. Can I, uh, can I do a little special introduction? 
It's your show. So um, I learned a lesson, as I, I said, Santa Claus taught me this, that we are here on this earth to help one another. And um, you, if you lose yourself in the service of others, you'll find out that you're really only serving your God. And uh, it's extremely rewarding. Uh, I tell people all the time, they ask me, why do you do this thing with the vets? Come and spend one day and you'll understand. So I have a friend who is a police officer in the city of St. John. He lives out here. And he called me late last night about 11 o'clock and he said, I need your help. And he told me of a situation of a, uh, of a Canadian vet and his daughter who had uh, recently experienced a house fire and uh, lost everything they had and were really in a tough situation. This is three days, four days before Christmas. So immediately I called my buddy Al, who uh, Al's, Al's, my, Al's my go-to man whenever I need anything vet-wise. And Al got on the phone and he said, Rob, the only problem is, he said, You're not, we're not going to get any of those things until Wednesday because everything is closed. And I got thinking, I said, well, I've got, a, I've got an Airbnb right over here, not being used. We made it so that we'd have a place to keep uh, to the vets to stay when we're, when we're teaching the class. Fully outfitted, it's got beds, it's got bedding, it's got towels, it's got all the kitchen appliances, dishes, everything you need, washer and dryer. I said, they can stay here. So um, Mike, the police officer, put me in touch, and uh, I'm sure Al did his stuff. I've been trying to call Al because he got hold of somebody through the Legion, which is uh, Canadian Royal Can or Canadian Legion is what helps vets. They have a poppy fund. And I went around the community. I said, you know what? This isn't about me trying to find somebody else to share the load. This is about giving other people the opportunity. So I went over to the hardware store, and I told them the story real quick. Well, they came back to me with uh, 40 minutes later, they had two or three or four bags of gifts all wrapped. And I went up to the grocery store, and that guy watches us, which is a big shout-out to him. So I didn't have to tell him the story. He already knew what we did. So they gave us stuff, and the, the gas station up the road gave me a $50 gift certificate. And I hope I'm not forgetting anything. And some other good people in this room stepped up to the plate. My wife went to town and got groceries. So over here to my right is Shane and his daughter, Avery, who are our guests for the next little while until uh, things improve. They're staying over here, so you might see a lot of them. And I just want you guys to know that this is an incredible community. Yeah, well, you know what? These guys have helped us do what we do. We've had 175 wounded vets go through our program, and a lot of it is due to the fact that people like this uh, open their wallets because they want to say thank you, and they do. So Merry Christmas! Hope you have fun. My son Rex, I, I went up to the top of the hill, and Mike, a friend of mine who sells Christmas trees, gave me a Christmas tree, and I called Rex and need your help. So Rex got the Christmas tree and got out the, all the ornaments and the lights and decorated the Christmas tree. So they have a Christmas tree and there's lots of presents under that tree. There's even more. Somebody else that shall be nameless, nameless. Came with a great big bag full of wrapped up Christmas presents. So, you know what? It's You'll never regret doing the right thing. And uh, it's an honor to be able to do it. So, you're, you are so welcome. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to help. And if Mike's watching, Mike, I'm so glad that you knew and thought that you could call on me and I would help. That's fantastic. And thank you for being that off police officer who was looking out really for the, uh, you know, he, he didn't have to do this. He was just doing his job, but he, over and above. You're a good guy, Mike. And thank you, Rex, sure. my son. I met Mike through Rex. So it's all connected. Okay. And Avery likes horses. I don't like horses. My wife and my daughters love horses. <laughs> anyway, next Frick. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> All right, next one's from Ken Wilson. Mike's Air Force, by the way, Canadian Air Force. Retired. Uh, Ken Wilson in the chat says, how long do you allow your wood to acclimate to your shop's environment before you begin a project? Well, if you, uh, if you really want to be careful, and you need to be, because to, to build something and then only to have it move afterwards because you ignored this, 
uh, you do it at your own peril. The absolute most accurate way to do it is to take the board, weigh it, and weigh it every day, and don't start working with it until the weight starts to fluctuate, meaning it goes up a little, and the next day it goes down a little, and up a little and down a little. It'll either, when it first comes into your shop, it'll either consistently lose weight or consistently gain weight. Remember, that piece of wood has moisture. So when we say uh, this board has uh, 7% moisture content, that means 7% of its weight is water. There is water in that board. That means the room, the environment in this room, is consistent with a 7% moisture content. If the room, if I had lots of pots of water laying around here or some boiling some water and there was steam in the room, that would rise. And if the environment would rise, the wood would absorb more. So if you want to be really safe, get yourself a reliable scale, weigh your board, and wait until it starts to normalize. It'll up and down, up and down. It'll just fluctuate very small. But that's the best, the best, most accurate. Next, for, oh, That was a good question. That was a really good one. The last t-shirt, who was that? Frick. I should have saved this last. Now nobody's going to ask the question. Uh, Ken Wilson. Ken? This t-shirt's for you, brother, on its way on Wednesday. Next question, Frick, please. All right, next one comes from Anthony Antonucci. He says, is camellia oil still recommended on tools to prevent rust? Yeah, I mean, uh, Luther likes to use, what, how does he call it? Camellia Earl. Camellia Earl. That's his favorite. Um, I, I, use, I use my tools all the time, and I keep my, my shop is uh, controlled. So it's never cold, it's never warm, it's never humid. It stays the same. So under those circumstances, you're not going to get rust on your tools if you uh, live in an un if you work in an unheated garage or you go through uh, long stretches when you're not using your tools, then you have to do something. I still think that the socks are the best. Nothing to wipe on, nothing to wipe off. But if you don't like that, the camellia oil is uh, food grade, meaning you can eat it, so you don't have to worry about it being on your hands or breathing its vapor. It's it's safe. Non-toxic. So, your call. And Angie, thank you very much. The chocolate bars are almost gone. I love these. There's no, uh, there's no sugar in them and lilies. Oh, good. I only eat them at Christmas. So, we still have a sharpening kit to give away, a panel gauge, a mark, a dovetail, a shooting board, one of my wood hinge boxes, and another Curfex 10. So, we'll do that. Next. Um, this one's from Brad Manning in the chat. What Brad. projects are best hey, to start for a beginner that has never done any woodwork before? Well, um, it's a good question, Brad. Too bad you uh, don't have any T-shirts left. <laughs> uh, mm, a good first project. Well... The first one we did, we have what's called the online workshop. And we started, Jake and I started this, and Jake and I and Frick, pardon me, started this back in 2011. So we, uh, what we would do, we still do it, we broadcast, we film three 45-minute episodes each week, almost, on, and take you through the process of building a piece of furniture from the design right through to applying the finish. And when we started it, we started it as, okay, you're brand new at this. So the first thing we did was a pencil box. Ken, would you mind? Pencil that, that pencil box with the sliding lid. And it's got the scallop lid. It's pine. It's out there on that, uh, out there where all the other stuff is. A, a candle box. Sorry, not a pencil box. I meant to say candle box. I'll show you that. So that was the first thing we did. And the reason was it was small, so the pieces were not, they weren't going to take you a month to dimension them. And from there, we moved on to um, a little hall table, which was, so the first one, you, you learn to cut dovetails. You learn to cut a groove with Jesse's drawer bottom plane. The next one was a hall table. 
So you learn to work with a wider piece. You learn to make mortise and tenon joints because there were four legs and they were joined with a mortise and tenon on two sides and the top was attached. Thank you. After that, we did a bookcase which involved mortise and tenons and dovetails and bigger pieces. So I would say, I would say a bookcase is a really good project and you can make it as complicated or uncomplicated as you want. There was the pencil box we made. So we did half blind dovetails, which might be a little bit complicated. You're gonna to have to learn to do the joints first. We, we, we started with rough lumber, rough lumber meaning it was not planed. We did all that by hand. We cut that groove in there. We took the lid and we cut a, a, a rabbit all the way around that would fit into that groove so that you could close it. And then uh, just for fun, we took a round bottom plane and we scalloped it just so it wasn't boring and flat. Now, having said that, you might be better off with a bookcase, a simple bookcase or a simple table. Just something that allowed you some very basic joinery and you need to learn what flat is, you need to learn what square is, you need to learn what parallel is, and you'll also soon appreciate that whatever you build is a sum of the parts. If you allow for a 2% error on every piece and you've got 30 pieces, that's a big problem. You have to, you have to learn to do things so that you cannot see error. Shooting board. As soon as I'm done this, I'm going to give away that shooting board. A shooting board is a device that enables you to hold the workpiece and the tool at right angles. If I'm looking in plan view, there's a right angle this way, and there's also a right angle this way. So instead of putting this in my vise, if you can imagine, if I needed to square up that piece of wood, which... That piece of wood is not going to be easy to use because it always has cuts in it. Let's use this one instead. So I, I need this to be nice and square. I have the option of putting it in the vise, which will hold it securely, and then taking my plane, moving Troy's net. I hope so hope Troy's on. First thing I've got to do is cut, make a little chamfer on the back side. Then I've got to balance the plane this way, and I've got a plane forward and back. And the whole time I'm doing it, I've got to keep from tipping one way or the other. And that's going to require me to come in with my, plan, my square and check it. I'm going to have to check it in two directions. I'm going to have to check it this way to see if it's staying square. I'm going to have to check it this way to see if it's staying square. And you can well imagine that that could be a long, drawn-out process, particularly if you have multiple pieces of wood. Instead, you have a shooting board. And if your shooting board is accurate, and the ones we sell, thanks to Brandon, are very accurate. So the shooting board holds these two pieces at right angles, allows you to go in. Don't forget your grip. And now, when you're done, you know that it's square this way and it's square that way. So when I say you have to make it so that you cannot see error, as long as you can't see error, you can't do better than that can only measure what you can see. Now, if you put all those pieces together, things should work. So a simple, simple uh, bookcase or a simple table, hall table with four legs would be a great first project. Next, Fred. Oh, yeah, let's give that away. Yeah, we got to do so a couple prizes here. We're going to give away an 18-inch shooting board made by Brandon. Brandon's been working with us how long, Ken? Almost a year? Almost a year. Almost a year. Great guy. Everybody likes Brandon. He's so easy to get along with. My wife said the other day, you know what? Anytime I need help, he's there. It's just great. So I'm going to sign this right on top. Who's it going to? A second. I've got to update the names here. Actually, right. I better not. Only because they may be left-handed. This is a right-handed. We make left-handed, so if the, whoever gets it, you need to tell us which your right hand or left hand, and if you want, I'll sign it. All right, this one's going to Robert Sacco in Orange, Massachusetts. Hi, Robert. Congratulations. Let us know if you're right hand or left handed. We know which one to send you. Put it in the mail for you on Wednesday. Merry Christmas. Do another one. Do another one. We only have twenty minutes left. Okay, let's let's give away Jesse's uh, panel gauge. 
This is like a big marking gauge. Very precise tool. So who's the panel? Who's going to be the lucky person to get the panel gauge? Let's find out. It's going to Victor Rankins in Bakersfield, California. Hey, Victor. Congratulations, brother. You'll love it. Now, I've got to put the cutter in. The cutter's not in the, in the back end, but the cutter will be in there. This ends for your pencil. That ends for your cutter. So one gives you an approximate. The other one gives you a precise. You turn the head around, take it off, and flip it around so that the rabbit, which is designed to run like this so that the tool doesn't move like that, and this allows you, back in hand tool method days, this allows you to make this edge parallel to that edge. It's like a big marking gauge. Made out of uh, figured maple with a uh, Osage orange wedge, and the beam is torrified maple, so it doesn't move. Next, Rick. Any more vets, Ken? Didn't we just give away two? How many do we got left? Yeah, you gotta have to. You have to whip through them. Well, we just gave away two. Give me, give me a one question. Okay, uh, this one comes from James Quinless. He says, "How much tolerance is there in the dowel you make for wood hinge boxes?" How much tolerance? Uh, what is the tolerance on the hinge and the wooden box? Okay, so. What we're shooting for is 0 0.25, 0. Um, the, uh, the jig that cuts, that drills the hole, that's actually the one that's 3 eighths. I don't know where it's sitting, but anyway. So the hole in there is, I think, right on 0 0.25. So I do not want my dowel to be bigger than that because if you do, it'll leave a burnish, it'll burnish the outside. I wouldn't want it to be any less than point, uh, if it was 0.246, I wouldn't want any less than that because then you start to get a little bit of slop in there, which may not give you a perfectly centered hole. So 0.248, 0.249. And you're talking in thousands. In thousandths of an inch, yeah. yeah. And that's doable. That's doable. If, if, if your jig brings it out to 0.251, then what you do is you put your dowel, put your dowel in, uh, put your dowel, I'll show you this. Put your dowel in a drill. So here's a piece of, here's a piece of uh, quarter inch dowel. Put your dowel in the drill. Now these are, what are these, these, these are sanding blocks, so they're sponge, and what I do is I put a piece of um, uh, 320 grit paper on there, and I put it in here like this, and what, the, what these sponges do is they just even out the pressure, and then I'll just spin that a couple of times, it doesn't take very much, and I'll bring, get out my, I'll get out my, uh, my mic, calipers, And then I'll measure that. And that's 246. I wouldn't want to go any less than that. Good question. Sorry, I don't have a t-shirt left. Next. Let's give away, let's give away a, a Curfix 10. All right. Two. Two Curfix 10s. One. I already gave it away. I meant two who. Oh, countdown. Uh, this one's going to Ron Bingham in Sleaford, UK. Hey, Ron. All the way over in the UK. Congratulations. Merry Christmas. In the mail on Wednesday. So we only have three prizes left. Plus the current. The, we'll do the three uh, dead cats together at the end. Next, Frick, please. You should do one more right now. You only did one. Huh? You only did one right there. You should do one. We've got 10 minutes, 12 minutes. We'll stop again, and I'll do one. All right. One um, Kyle Rogers in the chat wants to know, what types of Australian hardwoods have you tried, and what are your thoughts? Jara. Probably the only... Well, no, I've got some... I had a fellow from Australia stop in one time, and he brought me some. I, don't, I unfortunately didn't write it down. Hard as a rock. I have worked with Jara, um, Lacewood. It's a 
sit and think for a while. Eucalyptus. They're hard, and you guys must use carbide tools because they are hard. If you tried to plane some of those, the plane would literally slide over the top, wouldn't bite in. I don't know what you guys do to grow your wood over there, but wow. Next, Rick. Uh, Jerry Gillette wants to know. Hi, Jerry. Where do you get your inspiration for your projects? Where do I get my inspiration? You know, that's an interesting question. Because Jeff and I were talking about this the other day. I think it was Jeff and I were talking about it. Every once in a while, we'll have somebody call and ask us. Do you know what, do you know what, our, uh, do you know what our sharpening station looks like? Our sharpening station is, is on the end of that bench. It's a, uh, Ken, can you lift up that piece of styrofoam? All right, have I got one here? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, mine's all hidden. That one's a little bit easier. Here's the sharpening station. It's a piece of wood piece of plywood that is screwed to a piece of hardwood that is screwed under that it's got a one degree slope on it and we fasten it to there that's what we sharpen on and we have people wanting plans for it and i think to myself are you kidding me plans for it it's two pieces of wood there are some folks that do not have or have not developed their uh, ingenuity, their ability to create. Or maybe they just don't have it, I don't know. But I fortunately, I think anyway, I was born taking stuff apart and trying to put it back together and fix it or improve it along the way from the time I was a little kid. So I, um, I try not to get inspiration from other people's furniture. I try not to look at that. I, 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 I apply first the function... I need this table to be this tall and this wide or this long, and I need it to hold this, this, and this. So you work with that first, and then I make it look pleasing. And the pleasing part may be the proportions, the wood it's made out of, and you go from there. So I don't know if that's something you can even teach, but I would say form and function have to be together, and I think function always has to be the primary one. Why build it if it doesn't work? It has to have, I mean, this is a good example. We, uh, we're, we're building this. I love talking about this too. Can you turn that over here? So this is a project that we're working on to help the Purple Heart Project. So this was the prototype. It was a tool cabinet. It's got three drawers and two doors that will close. So we built a prototype first out of just plywood. We'll probably give this away too. Now we're working on the real thing. Well, in the process of working on the real thing, we realized we had a few problems. And one of them was how we held the saws. So what we did is we redesigned this. So we now have a, a, so we'll have a saw till on either side. And the saw till will come out. Let me get it on here, right? Might be a little bit early showing you this. No, there it is. The saw till will come out like this. And your saw will sit in that sleeve. And then you tilt it back in when you're not using it. And it's tucked in there nice and neatly. And that was, a, that you know, you join our online workshop and you go see how we went through. You know, this was the original mock-up. The original mock-up was made out of a piece of plywood again. And we had to figure out how it was going to sit in there. And then we had to figure out a way, well, what do you, what's going to keep it from falling? So we came up with this little bracket. And then we had to figure out the relief we had to cut because you didn't want to see it out here. This is another example. So the problem with having a deep drawer is you get anything beyond an inch of ingredient stuff in the bottom and you lose the rest of it. So we put these little slides in. We built this little removable tray and now that doubles the capacity of your useful capacity of your drawer. So it's always about problem solving and then try to make the problem solving Interesting. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but uh, it's thought provoking. Okay, let's give away. Uh, let's give away our Mox and Vice. This is brand new. Ken makes these. Ken and Kevin. Rick, didn't make them? I thought Kevin did. Yeah. So here, this is mine. This is the prototype. The one in the box is brand new. It's made out of poplar. So here's how you use this. And I'm going to sell you on this. Because this is a nice function. If you're a little bit older, what's a little bit older, Ken? How do we define that? 
<laughs> so if you've got a bad back or you're just older, having to reach down here to cut dovetails may or may not be comfortable. You don't want to be sawing dovetails up like that because the board vibrates. You need to have it down low. But as I said, it may be uncomfortable. So what you can do is you can make or buy a Moxon vise because we also sell the hardware that we've souped up. If you buy one of these, or if you win this one, you simply take it like this, put it on your bench. You need a clamp on either side, which doesn't take long. I love these F clamps made by Bessie. These are spring loaded, so when you back these off, it automatically opens it up for you. You don't need the third hand. Now you can put your board in there. It's lined with cork rubber, which Luther calls crubber, where he came up with that. You snug that up. Now it securely holds your workpiece, but instead of cutting down here, now you're cutting up here. And uh, it's fantastic. And you've got that great big capacity. I think, I think, what, do you know what the capacity is on these? I think this is the same. 16 inches. So, well, supports it really well. We sell the kit if you want to make your own, or soon, which in the next in the next week or two, you'll be able to buy them in the box, all ready to go. Literally, you'll take it out of here like that and put it on here. Do we not pack it all? To, do we pack it ready to? Does it come like that in the box? Yeah, it's like that. We take it out of the box. Okay, so you literally take it out of the box and put it on your bench. Who are we giving it to? Let's find out. Mm -mm 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 -mm. It is going to Skip Martin in Williamson, Georgia. To Skip. Congratulations, Skip. We'll put it in the mail for you on Wednesday. Have a Merry Christmas and enjoy your mocks and vice. Next, Fred. Just draw the rest of the prizes, please. Why? Are you wanting to go home? Well, I have another appointment after this. You do? Yes, I do. Any more presents? I mean, any more questions? Well, actually, tonight's been really good for questions, so we'll save some for next time, but I've had a, a lot of uh, really good questions. In fact, Luther's had to send me five emails full of questions, when normally it's only one. Okay. So, great job, everybody. Sorry we couldn't get to everything. We'll save the box for the last, sharpening for the second to last. Let's do the saws. So in here, thanks to Ian, there are two saws, a cross cut and a rip. These are the Cosmos saws that were in development for probably four years. Might even been longer than that. So in here's two. There's a pair of them. This, this is valued at uh, 275 times two, so almost $600. 550 we'll call it. Who's it going to? It's going to Tom Val Valeriano in Pennsylvania. Tom? Here you go, Tom. Two brand new saws in the mail for you on Wednesday. Happy Merry Christmas, brother. Okay, who's going to get this sharpening kit? This is a big deal, too. This is, a, this is over $500. I'll sign, the, I'll sign the box. Who's okay. the sharpening kit going to? <clears throat> it is going to... Irvin wanted this one, but he's disqualified. Uh, Steve Spry in Bideford, Devon, UK. Wow, a lot of stuff going across the pond. Steve, congratulations, brother. Probably $500 just to mail it to you. In the mail on Wednesday. And we'll give the, th we'll give the, the three dead cat sweaters away at the end. So this is, a, uh, this is a Rob Cosman wood hinge box. Bird's eye maple and walnut. Signed on the bottom. Numbered. Number W W zero zero six. Wood hinge. Lovely little box. Who's it going to? It's going to Who? Roger Hohen in Wisconsin. Hey Roger. Merry Christmas, brother. Put it in the mail for you on Wednesday. Now, we got three dead cat sweaters we always give away, thanks to Moose. Big shout-out to Moose. Couldn't be here tonight. It's too close to Christmas, I guess. These will keep you warm no matter where you are. It's the it's most 
It's the most comfortable garment you will ever have, and it's light as a feather, but it'll keep me, it keeps me warm down to minus 15. All right. Three winners of the Dead Cats are Lincoln Gill and Barbados. Lincoln and Barbados. Maybe in the evening. <laughs> Second one's going, oh, he already won. Steve again. Steve? One yeah. Are we allowed to give two presents to some same guy? Uh, no. Okay. So I'll redraw that one. And yeah. the third one is Scott Bryden in Indiana. Hey, Scott, Indiana. Yeah, you'll want it there. Okay, so let's Who's do... Who's the third one going to? Let's do one more. Sorry, Steve. What What did Steve win? The sharpening kit? I think so, yeah. Oh, wow. That was the most expensive prize we gave away, I think. Uh, Jim Belair in Comox, British Columbia. Another one in oh, BC. Jim, you'll, you'll need it in BC. Congratulations. Okay, did you have something I well, forgot? Fifty four hundred. Thank you, thank you, folks. Appreciate that. We uh, we will put it to good use. You will change the lives of many combat wounded veterans. I promise you that. You heard it from Jeff. Big thank you to Jeff for what he's done. Uh, thank you for Ken for being here all the time. He does it on his own. Frick, Frick, we pay him handsomely to be here. What? No, we don't. No, we don't. Since when? <laughs> Frick volunteers his time. Luther volunteers his time. Jake volunteers his time. Uh, oftentimes, uh, Chris is here, Moose is here. Um, fantastic. A real community effort. We appreciate it. I hope you have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We will see you in January. We'll try to do this twice a month, every second Saturday. And big thank you to Irvin for coming up tonight and filling in for Jake while he's out relaxing and doing nothing, laying around. Um, big shout out to Angie, Angie and Lynn. Angie packages up all her T-shirts. So here's what you want to do. Buy a Purple Heart T-shirt to put Angie to work. I don't want her loafing. She has got to work. Work, Angie. Work, work, work. And she appreciates all the comments. And she does. She loves to read the comments. So keep those coming as well. Anything else, Rick? Am I forgetting anybody or anything? Big shout out to Luther. Luther, Merry Christmas, brother. Love you. Hope you and Erica have a wonderful Christmas. And, and no final vets to say hello to? Thank you to my wife for allowing me to do this. Okay, guys, have a wonderful one. Merry Christmas.